If God be glorified, we ought to be satisfied. Do you know it's scary to preach that message? Because uh, I struggle with being satisfied. I, I struggle with uh, not being content sometimes. No. When I confess that to you, you think, oh, what's wrong with pastor? I think I'm a pretty satisfied person. I think I'm a pretty content person. I enjoy my life. I, I'm a person who walks around thanking God for my blessings. But the truth of it is, is there's this wickedness in my soul that's always dragging me down. And it's easy to get into a place where you start griping or complaining, or feeling bad, sorry for yourself, or wishing you had this, or wishing you had that, or wanting to be able to run like you could when you were 20. <laughs> uh, you know, a healthy thing is to do to look forward to heaven when everything's made right. But if God be glorified, we ought to be satisfied. And yet we look around and we've got a lot of questions. We have a lot of concerns. Uh, if God loves us, why does he let parents get divorced? I mean, two parents like this, like this, and then they're separated in the kids. And the kids struggle with this for years. I know adults whose parents were divorced from their children who still struggle, who still struggle. Hard to have trust. He allows people, God allows us to struggle with sins that they wish they didn't have. You know, if I could sign a paper, Dan would never be impatient again. I'd sign that in a heartbeat. And yet God, for reasons I don't always understand, thinks that he's more glorified that I confess my weakness and go through the struggle and submit myself to him repeatedly, learning to bite my tongue, learning to be uh, more like him in patience rather than flipping a light switch and Dan is patient. If God is real, why has he let thousands of his people get murdered by nasty thugs like ISIS and North Korea, the government of North Korea. If God's real, why are the good suffering and perishing? People that are brothers and sisters, people that we would worship with and pray with and rejoice with because they may speak a different language, but we've been brought together around one Savior. We're meeting together at the foot of the cross because we're... <laughs> Sinners who need the Savior, and we're unified across the bounds of language and culture and, and, and flags by the blood of our good, good Savior. And yet, he lets his people suffer and die terribly, uh, praying for salvation and getting their heads cut off. If God knows what he's doing, why do some children go hungry? get raped, have to fight cancer, suffer and die. Have you ever heard anybody say, if God was real, why should even one child go hungry? And think about this. If you had the power to end cancer, to end hunger and the abuse of children, you would end it, you would have ended it in a heartbeat. You'd end it before I finish this sentence. And God hasn't. So does that mean he doesn't have the power? Well, no. Or maybe he doesn't really care. Well, I don't believe that. You don't believe that. Questioning God is not new, and the Bible is full of this kind of honesty. And I'm glad it is. We've got a real God who's right here with us in our real struggles, our real pains, and we don't have to pretend. And isn't that good? I've got a friend who was one of my seminary professors, pastor of Elmbrook Church over uh, near Milwaukee. And a couple weeks ago, I shared this with you, his beautiful 30-year-old daughter, living for Jesus Christ, full of faith, sharing her faith, an evangelist, uh, suddenly passed away at home, got sick. They thought she was just sick. Heart stopped, breathing stopped. They called the ambulance. They couldn't revive her. And here, this man who's given his whole life to serving the kingdom, said, I had two kids and now I have one. 
and I pick up my phone and I want to call her and I can't. And he says, I'm wailing in despair. And yet he wants to be faithful. He wants to trust the Lord through this. He wants God to be glorified through this. But there's pain. You know, pain in the offering doesn't just mean when the offering plate goes around, right? <laughs> there's pain in that offering too sometimes. But pain in the offering means in this life you will have trouble. I'm not making that up. Jesus said that. Uh, Ecclesiastes 8.14. There's something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. Vanity. Habakkuk 1.2. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Psalm 10, 1-4. O oh, Lord, why do you stand so far away? Now, we know Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, right? We know that. But our condition, our human condition, when we're in the middle of suffering, sometimes we can't see God. We've got to take our eyes off of ourselves and look at the Lord, right? But it's hard. And we cry out just like the psalmist, Lord, why are you standing so far away? Why do you hide when I am in trouble? The wicked arrogantly hunt down the poor. Let them be caught in the evil plan they uh, in the evil that they plan for others for they brag about their evil desires they praise the greedy and curse the lord the wicked are too proud to seek god they seem to think that god is dead you ever feel like you're living in a world where those with power live and act as if god's not really that important or if he's dead or if he just doesn't care doing their own thing changing the rules deciding good is bad and bad is good and you wonder god you doing something about this exodus fourteen eleven. then they said to moses this, this is one of those verses that is humorous shows a lot about the human condition and it's the kind of thing that i don't know makes it into the bible unless it is an actual quote that really happened they said to moses is it because there are no graves in egypt that you've taken us out here to die in the wilderness why have you dealt with us in this way, Bring us, bringing us out of Egypt? They wanted to go back to Egypt at that point. Uh, when life gets hard, sometimes people want to run away from God, go back to their old ways. Brothers and sisters, this is an honest book. And aren't you glad? It's beautiful. It's not the way a human being would write it. It's, it's the inspired word of God. We're going to read the first half of John chapter 11, so you can turn there in your Bibles today. John chapter 11. I love the sound of rustling pages of rustling Bibles. It means God, people are getting there to find what the Lord has for us. We are going to see Jesus questioned today. Uh, have you ever thought that we would never be like the disciples or we'd never be like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years? If God were here, we wouldn't ask any questions. Well, God is here. We have the Holy Spirit within us, and we do ask questions. Uh, people doubted Jesus' judgment. <clears throat> His inner circle the ones he invested his life in. He ate with them. He walked with them. They lived together. They went with him everywhere. They were covered in his dust as he'd walk along the roads. They were that close to him. They could feel his breath on their faces when they gathered together to pray, and they questioned him. And other followers who dearly loved him, and they trusted him, and yet when they're confronted by tragedy, death of Lazarus, their brother, uh, the horror of losing a brother, the horror of losing a loved one, and you can't breathe and you can't figure out how life is going to go on, they begin to quietly judge or question Jesus. If you would have done something, and you can, right? This would not have happened. Have you ever been there? Well, you're in good company. A lot of folks in the Bible have been there too. Let's look at this, John 11, 1 through 16. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. 
He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now this is interesting because we haven't been introduced to them yet in this text, but John is assuming that the early Christians were already aware of this family. And so it could be that he knew that people already had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or if this was just common knowledge, it was still verbally being spoken of by these first, second generation Christians. So he, taught, he brings up this couple and he just assumes that we'd know them. And then in verse 2 he said, This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured out perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And John assumes everybody knows this story. He's not going to talk about it till chapter 12. But, but when he writes it here, he puts this little parenthetical statement in here. It's just, yeah, oh yeah, that, that person. We all know that person. So the sisters sent word to Jesus the one you love is sick. And he would know that that would be Lazarus. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. Now, I can remember reading this as, as a younger person, thinking, that makes me uncomfortable because it feels like a lie. This sickness is not going to end in death. If you know the story of Lazarus, he dies, right? No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through this. And I was reading some old commentators, and they all wanted to emphasize that uh, the glory of Jesus Christ was the result of, of, uh, of uh, Lazarus' sickness. It wasn't the cause of Lazarus' sickness. That was a, a point that they all wanted to make. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And Martha is called by name here. Uh, Mary and Martha, but he loved, he loved this, uh, these uh, siblings. It's a neat family. Isn't it nice? It doesn't always happen when all the brothers and all the sisters are together loving Jesus. I don't know if they had other members of their family that weren't walking with the Lord, and that's why they're not mentioned. But these three, two sisters and a brother, very different people, different personalities, all of them, followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved Martha. Jesus loved uh, her sister Mary in, in Lazarus. All different. We have a shepherd who knows his sheep, and we're different, and yet he loves each one of us. This, I, I don't, I'm, I'm concerned that the message this week is, is obviously so much higher than the messenger. I'm concerned that what really moved me, I'm not going to be able to communicate today. But it, it really touched me the differences in these two sisters and this brother. Different people, and yet Jesus loves each one of them. So, when he had heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. You didn't see that one coming, did you? So, they sent messenger, Lazarus, whom you love, is sick, and Jesus loved them, and he heard this, and he waited around, he tarried two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Now, Judea was where he left. People were trying to kill him. But Rabbi, sensei, teacher, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see with the Lord's light. It is, it is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Basically, what he's saying is, do what God wants you to do. We're going to fall down when we don't do what God wants us to do. Then we'll be walking in the darkness. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, and it's funny to me how often they did this. Uh, like when the Lord uh, healed the woman who was bleeding for so long, he said, Somebody touch me. And they said, Lord, you're surrounded by a lot of people. There's a lot of people bumping into you. They always thought they had to explain things to Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to go wake him up. His and his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he's going to get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told him plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> and you could just imagine that conversation. Lazarus is sleeping. I'm going to go wake him up. If he's sleeping, that's good. He's gonna, that's not bad. He's going to get better. He's dead, guys. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Wow. Then Thomas, remember him? Doubting Thomas. 
also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, all right, let's go. We'll just go die with him, I guess. Uh, they're, they're going, and he's faithful. He's going to be with his master, but he does not think this is going to end well. He's doing what he thinks is right, even though he thinks it's not going to end well. Verse 4 again, this sickness will not end in death. I, I emphasize that in my notes, put it in capitals and made it bold. See, Jesus didn't say he's not going to die. He said it's not going to end in death. Now, if, if, again, if you know Lazarus' story, it's interesting for Jesus to say this, that it's not going to end in death because Lazarus is going to die, right? Lazarus dies and Jesus goes there and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And uh, Lazarus stumbles out of the tomb and I'm imagining some little kid said, Daddy, and others said, Mommy. Uh, that, you know, I'm probably going to do that again next week, so just get ready. <laughs> you know, there's a handful of people in the Bible that get resurrected. You know what that means? They had the blessing of having to die twice. Not, not that great. I mean, you do it if it's for the Lord's glory. And you're thankful for that time with your loved ones. But that's... Death, I'm assuming, I'm thinking, is probably one of the most difficult things we have to go through, and having to face that twice, that's hard. But Christ is seeing a bigger picture here, as he always does. We see just a small portion of our lives. God sees the big picture, and he very confidently proclaims that Lazarus' story doesn't end with death. He goes through it. He doesn't stay dead. Brothers and sisters, your story will include death if Christ doesn't come back and, and take us out of here in our lifetimes. Your story is going to include death. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, your story does not end with death. In fact, I really believe that this life we hold on to, and it's precious and it's a gift, and we love the people that God has put into our lives. And we're afraid, and we don't want pain. It's kind of silly to want pain. But when this heartbeat stops and this brain flatlines, and we wake up in the presence of the Lord in paradise that we were created for. Remember, Adam and Eve were created for paradise. We wake up and we breathe in the fresh air of eternity and we're basked in the love and the acceptance of our God. All of our sins wiped away, every tear washed away. We're going to wonder, why was I holding on so tight? And, and I don't believe that there is a pain we can go through. There's not a struggle we can go through. There's not something that's so, a suffering that's so great that we won't say, oh, thank you, it was worth every moment to be here. Our story does not end with death. Let's continue reading from verse 17 now, and we're going to go through 37. On his arrival, so he, he walked with his disciples to Bethany. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them for the loss of their brother. And so from the text, I wonder if they're, they're not a wealthy family because Martha prepared the meal herself instead of having a servant, or, or maybe she had a servant she was directing, but they do seem to be a, a well-off family, and they have a lot of people who are coming out uh, to meet them. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, Martha went to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Uh, Martha is the one that always acts, okay? She's the one who was uh, preparing the food while Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now she hears Jesus is coming. She goes out. She wants to go out to meet Jesus, but Mary stayed at home, and the reason was she was crying so much for her brother. Her heart was broken and devastated, and she was at home totally distraught. Now Martha probably had a broken heart too, but she she was a little more in control of her emotions and, and didn't let them show the way Mary does. Lord, sa said Martha to Jesus, 
if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, there's a beautiful faith there. There's a little bit of accusation there. These are real people. They believe in Jesus, and yet why did this happen? This did not have to happen. We worship a God, and anything is possible with God. And yet, he did not choose to act at that time. If you had been here, my brother, Lazarus, and people think it was probably their little brother, since Martha's always mentioned first she owns the home, so she's maybe the big sister, then Mary. You know how you love those little guys in the family? How the bigger brothers and sisters love the little guys? And the little guy was taken from them. I remember when I was growing up, I was 17 when my sister Rachel was born. I used to, and mom and dad love Rachel more than the rest of us. Everybody knows that. And I, I used to pray seriously, Lord, please protect Rachel. If you have to take one of us, take me. Don't take it because that would be too hard for mom and dad. And then I got married and had kids of my own. And I love my sister Rachel, but I stopped praying that prayer because <laughs> I've got responsibilities. Uh, now it's, Lord, take, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a joke. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. This pastor over at Elmbrook, his daughter will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You know what's neat about that? That's not a teaching that's explicit or clear in the Old Testament. She got that because she was hanging around Jesus. She got this insight because she was listening to his teaching. And it makes a difference. So she's weeping, she's hurt, but she has this confidence and she knows that Christ is able to keep his promises, and we know even more because he rose from the dead himself. That's kind of a good <laughs> stamp that he can do what he says. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. These great I am statements we see throughout the Bible. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he die." So Jesus is factoring in the physical death here and say, you believe in me, you will live even if you die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Not truly. Do you believe this? This question still echoes. It echoes throughout eternity. It echoes in, uh, all across the globe. It's echoing uh, to everyone who hears this message, whether today or on the TV or the Internet. Do you believe this? Jesus declares boldly, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. Come to me and you will not die. You will have life eternal. Do you believe this? And she answers, yes, Lord. In your heart, can you answer, yes, Lord? Yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister. Uh, She went and called Mary. Isn't that nice? She's enjoying this time with Jesus. This is an important time with Jesus, but she knows it's important to go get her sister. Uh, You know what? We meet with God here every Sunday, and we've got Bible studies during the week, got a lot going on. Don't be selfish with this. Go out, grab your wife, grab your husband, grab your kids, grab your friends, grab your coworkers and your neighbors. Bring them to Jesus. Throughout the New Testament, we see people doing that all the time. They meet Jesus. What do they do? They go run and they grab people and bring them back uh, to meet Christ. And she went to Mary and said, The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. Isn't that beautiful? Mary, emotional Mary, is at home crying. She said, I want to see Mary. Bring her to me. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet entered the village but was still at the place uh, Jesus had not yet entered the village but was still at the place where Martha had met him 
When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. So she had people around her comforting her. Mary lost, uh, Martha lost her brother too, but she's going out to meet Christ because she heard he's on the way. Mary needed a lot of support. She needed a lot of folks to be around her. Uh, one commentator said Mary uh, was probably a bit vexing and trying to her friends, where Martha was probably a good friend to all of her friends. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. Again, emotional gal. Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. You notice she said the same words her sister had said. Those two sisters had been talking. And why didn't Jesus come and why isn't he here? If Jesus was here, Lazarus would not have died. They've been talking about it together. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he thought, why is this woman so emotional? Is that what it says? Have you ever found that people who are emotionally, very emotional can be draining? And have you ever found yourself in your heart really appreciating people that are like strong pillars and they're, they're always bringing strength and always have encouragement? Jesus loved them both. She was weeping. She was deeply moved, deeply troubled. Uh, she falls down at his feet. She accuses him. And in the middle of this accusation, Jesus says, well, these people have no faith away from me. No. He was deeply moved in spirit, and he was troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. I know that the original verse, the, the verses, the original didn't have verse markers. Uh, I think it's nice that the shortest verse in Scripture is God saw our pain, and he was with us there, and he wept. I shared this with you before. I don't buy into this idea that, well, we're just like raccoons and mice and other roadkill. We're just animals, and when we die, we recycle ourselves back, and isn't that so beautiful? Or we're just stardust, and we can die and be more stardust. There's no beauty in that. The people you love, there's no God. They're just dead and gone. And everything they've done will be forgotten in a generation or two. Think back to great-grandma, great-great-grandma, great-great-grandpa. Uh, and the things we do, the choices we make that, that we think are so important will not matter for the most part once we're gone, if there's no God. But we've got a God who doesn't tell us, get over yourself. It's not a big deal. We have a God who sees us in our pain and in our suffering, and instead of kicking us to the curb, instead of saying, why aren't you stronger? Why aren't you less emotional? Weeps with us. I have a Savior who weeps with me. I'm thankful for that. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Isn't that neat? Because he wept with them. Because he had emotions that showed the people around said, wow, he cares. Jesus really cared about Lazarus. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? <coughs> Fair question, right? Fair question. He gives and takes away, and we don't under, always understand why. The greatest Christians who have ever lived have died if they're not living now. That's, that's called logic, right? Uh, if, if they're not alive now, that means these great men and women of faith who had faith to move mountains, who, who laid down their lives, who lived sacrificial lives for the kingdom, doing all they can to bring people to faith in Christ, uh, who believed that Jesus is a great physician and saw miracles in their lives, these people still died. But their story didn't end in death. They went on to glory. Martha, Mary, Lazarus. I was reading something called the Interpreter's Bible, and they called them the unknown friends of Christ. There were a lot of people in the Bible who we know even less about than them. Uh, people who come in and out of the story, some of them we don't even give their names, but there are people who follow Jesus. 
people who loved him and were important to him that we hardly know about. And the question is, how many unknown friends to, of Christ today are in churches all over Janesville, loving him, believing in him, trusting him through the hard times, in churches all over Wisconsin and the, the Midwest and the United States? And we've got brothers and sisters in Canada who this week heard that if you use the wrong gender pronoun when talking to somebody, it can be a criminal offense. We've got brothers and sisters in, in North Korea and in China where they're facing difficult persecution right now. We've got brothers and sisters across the Middle East, all over Africa and in South America and all over Europe where it's not always cool or seen as intellectual or the in thing to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We have unknown sisters and brothers, unknown friends of Christ who are making a difference for his kingdom. Maybe their names are never going to be famous, but they're famous in heaven because they're living their lives for his glory, not themselves. Living their lives for the glory of God. I want to challenge you. There's nothing you can do for your life more important, nothing at all, not one thing in this life more important than bringing glory to Jesus Christ to bringing people to the foot of the cross. He, uh, he's the great victor who conquered death. And it's his will that we would go out and make disciples of all people. Well, let's get busy. Let's do the Lord's will. One source, again, uh, written in 1952. This is, uh, I remember I did this last time too. Uh, moms, you kind of probably remember when I spoke on Hell on Mother's Day once. Uh, well, twice, actually, yeah. And then uh, I remember last time was Father's Day. I gave this message that gave a lot of glory to the moms. I did not plan that. We're going to talk about moms again today. <laughs> but happy Father's Day, by the way. Uh, yeah, you guys are important, too. Yeah. Now, <laughs> well, listen, our culture devalues fatherhood. We need godly men who will stand up, let their children see them reading their Bibles, praying, singing out to the Lord. Uh, we need examples of men who are strong and confident and who humble themselves and bend their knees before the living God. And, and let the family see that. Let the children see that. So, so we thank you, thank you men, for, for being followers of Jesus Christ. And we need, we need more of you fellas. Uh, this uh, interpreter's Bible, written in 1952, but it doesn't seem that long ago. And yet, the language is almost alien. Uh, the mindset seems so ancient. But there are some beautiful truths here as well. I, I had to read this passage. I'm going to read you this passage because it just sounds so bizarre. You're going to be like, whoa, you can't say that. I mean, listen. A woman has no place in the headlines. Can you imagine a Christian book writing that? She lives a quiet and, as men judge, uneventful life. Now, that part really sounded bizarre to modern ears. But the next part was so beautiful and powerful and uh, in, in speaks to our culture too, I believe, talking about godly moms. It went on. Listen, godly moms. What a beautiful thing. Don't you want to be, get out of here. Don't you want to be a, a godly, well, not if you're a man. If you're a man, you want to be a godly man. But, but I mean, if you're a woman and you have children, you want to be a godly mother. Uh, she brings up her children in the fear of the Lord. We don't want our kids to be afraid of mice, insects, thunderstorms, uh, people's opinions, uh, some punks at school, peer pressure. We don't want our children to fear anything, but we do want them to fear the Lord. She brings up her children in the fear of God and in an atmosphere. The whole house is saturated of spiritual things, turning their faces in God's direction. Like, kid, look over here. No. You never notice you had to do that with little kids. You try to talk to them, and they're like this. You've got to grab their faces sometimes. And, kid, you're going to look at Christ now, turning their faces in God's direction, making Christ near and real to them so that they cannot wander from him and forget about him and be satisfied for long if they do. For a homesickness chases them back to their real place beside him. And does anyone, does anyone do anything more vital in telling than that? Strange, mused Martin Luther, that every 20 years or so, God builds himself a new church out of little children. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? If we don't bring the next generation for Christ, Christianity's over. Every generation. Martin Luther said, wow, this is kind of strange. Every 20 years, God builds a new church out of children. Because they have to rise up 
And if they don't rise up and follow Christ, we have no church. And the interpreter's Bible goes on to say, And no one helps God to do so more than the mothers hidden away in their homes, unknown friends of Jesus Christ. Let's have this attitude, uh, men and women, that uh, maybe we won't get the recognition, maybe we don't get the glory, but we want to live lives that put the spotlight on Jesus Christ. And we, we want to live lives that are building up the kingdom, maybe in quiet ways, in hidden ways, but it's not about us getting the attention. It's about Jesus Christ being glorified and him be, being lifted up. We, we first met these uh, three sisters in, in Luke 10, 38. And, and now, as they were traveling along, listen to this. <clears throat> this is from our, our last book we studied, Luke. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who was seated by the Lord's feet listening to his word. Isn't that beautiful? They're sitting there listening as Jesus taught. And the things that Christ was uh, 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 revealing were moving her, and she was lost in the wonder of the teaching of Christ. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? I really always feel for Martha when I read this. Because Mary, uh, sweet Mary, uh, she was there sitting. Well, guests were in the home. An important visitor was in the home. There was a lot of people there. There was a lot of preparations that had to be done. And Martha was trying to, I'm trying to do this to be a blessing to those folks. And, and she's, she's busy. She's working. She's focused. And yet, she's starting to sin. Because in her heart, She's harboring these accusations, and they're starting to grow, and there's just a, probably a little bit of bitterness going there. Jesus, Lord, don't you care? She's sitting on her backside. And, and probably she was sitting there nice and cool. And probably Mary's got sweat dripping down her face as she's running around trying to get things ready because she's trying to take care of people. Don't you care that my sister left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. You notice she's also, she's not only accusing her sister, who else is she accusing? Jesus. Those are nice stories, but we've got work to do. But the Lord answered her and said to her, Martha, Martha, don't you love the way he says her name twice? Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. And Martha... If I know human nature, shut up and listened and thought, well, fine, maybe the potatoes won't get done then. <laughs> and sweet Martha was wrong to have that attitude. Two very different sisters, both of them loved Jesus in their own way. Martha was showing her love by going out. We need Martha's, <laughs> don't we? Martha seems, again, to have everything under control. She's the active one. She's the one when, when their brother dies, Mary's just on the floor crying and people around her trying to console her. Martha is heartbroken as well, but she's got clear eyes and she hears Jesus coming, so she goes out to greet him. Two very different sisters. Martha is steady. Martha is practical. I like practical people. Martha is unselfish. She's a good hostess, which is an incredibly valued thing in that culture. She's a straight talker. She gets right to the point, even with Jesus. Mary is emotional. She's got these passions that go up and down. She was lost in the greatness of Christ's teaching. She's lost in her tears. Uh, she falls down when she gets into Jesus. Oh, like this, you know. Oh, come on, Mary. Over. Come on. You know. In chapter 12, we've got this beautiful scene uh, where Mary goes to where Jesus is, and she pours out expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. And Mary, in this incredibly dramatic, emotional way, pours out 12 ounces of perfume on his feet and dries them with her very tears, showing this incredible humility at the feet of Christ. An incredible uh, waste of money from a human point of view. The perfume was probably purchased as an investment or for trading, buying and selling, uh, part of a business deal, maybe, and that's, again, why I think the family was not rich but well off. Uh, it was worth between twenty and $30,000. Uh, 
it was a lot of money, and she poured it out, lavished it on Jesus Christ because she believed he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and she thought, I, there's, no, there's nothing, no, there's no expense too great to pour out my love and to show him how much I care and appreciate that he brought my, if this is in chronological order, which these Gospels always don't do that, but how much she appreciated what Christ has done, bringing her brother back to them. Uh, gratitude, appreciation, thankfulness just overwhelmed her as she showed this beautiful act of love for Christ. Two different sisters. This blew me away this week because it's easy to be to think that Martha would be an easy person to be around. And you might think Mary's kind of dramatic. She's a, she's a drama queen. Uh, she's very emotional. And Jesus loved them both. And Jesus, when she fell down weeping, he wept with her. What a God we have. What a good God we have. Matthew Henry's commentary talking about this whole scene, talking about how Christians die. Uh, said, it's no new thing for those whom Christ loves to be sick. It's been happening for 2,000 years, right? From some, from, it's been happening from the time of Adam and Eve after the fall. He came not to preserve his people from these afflictions, but to save them from their sins and from the wrath to come. However, it behooves us to apply to him in behalf of our friends. What, what is it? Behooves us to apply to him in behalf of our friends. He said, pray. <laughs> Go ahead and pray, our friends and relatives, when they're sick and when they're in tough circumstances. Let us reconcile us to the, to the deep dealings of providence that, are there all, that everything happens for the glory of God. Sickness, loss, disappointment are so. And if God be glorified, we ought to be satisfied. I want to be like that. God, if, and, and I'm not. And that's why this message is scary for me. God, no matter what happens to me, if you're glorified, let me be satisfied with that. Meaning, when you're sick, be sick in a way that brings glory to Jesus. When you've got relationship troubles, when you've got economic troubles, when, when we face any of the struggles of persecution, when people don't understand our faith, live through it in such a way that Christ is made attractive. We weep in this life. So did Christ. Weeping for us. We die in this life. So did Christ, dying for us. But all of this is for God's glory. And our story, just like Lazarus's story, does not end in death if we have given our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, if we become followers of Christ. It ends our lives in, in life and victory. That's how the story ends. You notice when you're going through a story or watching a movie, it gets difficult. But if you know how it ends then maybe you're not so upset. Maybe you're not so distracted. So we should live our lives, and when the time comes, we should die our deaths, all to make the name of Christ beautiful. Because if God is glorified through our living and through our dying, then we should be satisfied. Now I want to close uh, by reading you the lyrics of a, a song. Uh, this is an ancient hymn. I like to do this. This is, be this is fun. This fella lived over 1,500 years ago. And yet the words of this song sound like they're written by a modern evangelical. And I love to go back and read some of these ancient documents and, and, uh, and find people who are our brothers and sisters living for Christ in their time. This hymn was written by somebody named uh, Romanus Melodus, which means Rome the melody maker, or uh, Romanus the hymn writer. He was one of the most famous hymn writers of the early church. He was born in 490 A.D. He was Jewish, but a convert to Christianity. Isn't that neat? Uh, he became a deacon in the church. Uh, again, uh, wrote many of the hymns that the early church sang. And uh, the name of this hymn is The Raising of Lazarus or The Tears of Mary and Martha. Isn't that a beautiful theme for a song? I learned about this song because I was studying Augustine's commentary on John 11, and he quoted this hymn. And I think that's neat that this great theologian quotes this hymn, which is kind of emotional, and it blew me away. It's 18 stanzas long. I'm not going to read it all. It was very theological, which was a good thing, but also a bad thing, because some of the every, couple things in there I thought were a little sketchy. I cut those out. 
uh, about 1,500 years ago. Listen. Christ, knowing the thought of all, you asked to learn the tomb of Lazarus. In coming, you woke him, being four days dead, all-powerful, feeling pity and your compassion for Mary's and Martha's tears. Stopping the lamentation of Mary and Martha, waking their brother, there was a marvel of marvels to be seen, how the breathless suddenly was seen breathing. Think this is a man who was born Jewish, came to Christ. Marvel of marvels to be seen, how the breathless suddenly has been, was seen breathing. For when the voice went down, he shook Hades, fastens of the gate, and crushed the bars of death, and raised up again the corpse four days dead, feeling pity in his compassion for Mary's and Martha's tears. Let us all run with love to Bethany to see there Christ weeping for his friend. He suffers as the son of David. As the son of God, he ransoms the whole world from all the evils of the serpent. And four days dead, Lazarus he raises up, feeling pity in his compassion for Mary's and Martha's tears. And to end Martha's lament, the Savior of all, <coughs> addressing her, divinely then spoke, I am the light of the world and the resurrection of all the dead. The one believing in me forever will not die. O oh, ineffable compassion, Jesus, all merciful, who came to me for my sake. With palm branches, they all came out to meet. Savior, your approach, crying Hosanna to you. Now we all, the hymn from pitiable mouths, offer to you. I mean, from our poor mouths, we're all singing this hymn to you. Now uh, this hymn from pitiable mouths we offer to you, shaking the soul, and we cry out, you who are among the highest, Save the world that you have made, Lord, and wash away our sins just as before you washed away Mary's and Martha's tears. We who have been made dead by our sins, let us imitate the sisters of faithful Lazarus, calling to Christ in weeping and in faith and in love. Save us, you who became man by your will, and raise us up from the tomb of sins, immortal, wiping away, Lord, Mary's and Martha's tears. Let us all despise transient matter, and now to go to meet Christ the Savior, hastening to Bethany, so that may, we may feast with him and with his friend Lazarus and with the apostles. Being cleansed of all stain of thought, blamelessly we shall uh, see his divine resurrection, which you offered to us, taking away Adam's and Eve's tears. Right there at the beginning, Adam and Eve put things out of Way out, of, way out of the way they're supposed to be. Human beings suffering ever since, and Jesus came back to dry those tears and to fix things. And if you're Adam and Eve, thank you. Thank you. Can you imagine? Somebody came to fix the mess we started. I, I can't imagine how grateful they are. Uh, thank you, God, for uh, the witnesses of faithful brothers and sisters down through the ages. Let us be found faithful in our time as well. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Jansville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com.